Have a look at this map of the New York Central System from 1933. You'll certainly note the impressive density of rail lines and yards throughout the banks of the city. Under closer examination, you'll also see that many, if not most, of the major rail yards narrow down to a single track headed for open water. These are New York's lost train ferries, and for a time, they were the only practical way for most freight trains to reach Manhattan. Let that sink in. There was a time when trains traveled across the open water by ferry to places like Governor's Island, Hoboken, and Long Island. These days, very few remain in use, and many connection points have simply been abandoned and left to rot. Today, we discover New York's lost train ferry terminals. I'm your host, Ryan Sokash, and you're watching It's History. The early development of railways in New York City played a significant role in transforming the city's transportation landscape and fueling its growth as a major commercial center. In the mid-19th century, as the city rapidly expanded, there was a need for efficient transportation systems to connect various neighborhoods and facilitate the movement of people and goods. So in 1831, the first horse-drawn streetcar line, the New York and Harlem Railroad, began operations. This line ran along 4th Avenue, now Park Avenue, and became the foundation for the city's emerging railway network. Over time, additional horse-drawn streetcar lines were established, creating a web of routes throughout Manhattan. And this is when the development of steam-powered railways further revolutionized transportation in the city. In 1834, the Mohawk and Hudson Railroad opened, becoming the first steam-powered railway in the state. It connected Albany and Schenectady, and its success paved the way for the region's rail travel expansion. In the 1840s and 1850s, various railroad companies competed to build terminals and establish routes to and from New York City. This led to the construction of several Grand Train stations, such as the original Grand Central Depot in 1871 and the Jersey City Terminal in 1889. But reach was limited as there was always a complication in reaching Manhattan proper, especially for any incoming trains west of the Hudson. Finding an efficient way to bridge that gap would mean rail lines could offer service to Brooklyn, Queens, and beyond to Long Island, which was a huge business opportunity. The existing stations served as essential hubs for rail travel, connecting the city with destinations throughout the Northeast and beyond. However, as rail lines expanded into neighboring states and Long Island, the need for efficient methods to transport trains across bodies of water became apparent. And as you might imagine, train ferries emerged as the solution. These unique ferries, sometimes called train floats, were specialized vessels that carried rail cars across rivers and bays. They allowed for continuation of rail travel, bridging the gaps between different regions. From the start, train ferry connections were established between Manhattan and New Jersey, with Hoboken Terminal as a critical transportation hub. These ferries transported passengers and freight, enabling seamless rail travel between the states. Similarly, train ferry service connected Manhattan with Long Island, meaning in some cases, a train trip would include two water crossings. For example, the Pennsylvania Railroad operated train ferries from Long Island City Terminal, facilitating the movement of rail cars and passengers across the East River. The ferries themselves were interesting. Self-powered train ferries were not as common as their non-powered counterparts. One notable example was the Maryland, established in 1876 as a connection between Jersey City and Mod Haven in the Bronx. This ferry had two tracks on its main deck, transporting various types of passenger cars, freight, and mail. Another self-powered train ferry, the Ferdinando Georges, had a brief stint on the Hudson River. Constructed in Maine in 1909 for the Maine Central Railroad, it had three railroad tracks on its main deck. And although train ferries proved to be a fantastic short-term solution, they would not endure the test of time, as society was already on track to hyperconnectivity. In other words, commuters nor freight merchants were willing to spare the long-term cost of loading trains onto boats. 
Over time, as engineering and construction techniques improved, train ferries were gradually replaced by direct rail connections across waterways. This was for good reason. Ferries were prone to weather delays, mechanical failures, accidents, and poor scheduling. With all of this being compounded by another frequent critical flaw. You see, in the early 20th century, train ferries typically had multiple tracks on their decks to accommodate several rail cars simultaneously. The loading process involved guiding the trains onto the ferry, securing them in place, and ensuring proper weight distribution. The loading time would depend on factors such as the train length, the number of rail cars being loaded, the level of coordination between ferry and railroad personnel, and the efficiency of the equipment used for the loading, such as ramps and tracks. Loading a train onto a ferry would involve careful alignment, adjusting the tracks to match the ferry's configuration, and securing the rail cars to prevent movement during the voyage. While loading times could vary, it's reasonable to estimate that it would take anywhere from several minutes to an hour or more to load a train onto a ferry, depending on the complexity of the operation and the number of rail cars being transported. Even if the ferry ran on time, trains occasionally broke down on board, blocking and delaying the entire network. And it was for these reasons that bridges and tunnels, such as the Hellgate Bridge and the East River Tunnels, both of which we covered in previous videos, provided an efficient and continuous train route, reducing the reliance on train ferries. And so it was. The very last passenger train ferry in New York City was the Staten Island Ferry Train, also known as the North Shore Line, which operated until 1953. The North Shore Line connected St. George Terminal on Staten Island with Whitehall Terminal in Lower Manhattan, providing a direct rail link between the two regions. Passengers would board this train at St. George Terminal and remain on board as the train was loaded onto specialized ferries. The ferry would then transport the train cars across the upper bay to Whitehall Terminal, where passengers could disembark and continue their journey within Manhattan. In 1953, the passenger train service on the North Shore was discontinued. This marked the end of regular passenger train ferries in New York City. It should be noted here that the termination of this line was primarily due to the increasing popularity of automobiles and the subsequent demand for improved roads and bridges between Staten Island and Manhattan. Since then, the Staten Island Ferry has continued to operate as a passenger ferry service, but without transporting rail cars. Surprisingly, car floats replaced train floats for a time, with service reaching as far away as Albany, and freight train floats were still essential for reaching several industrial areas and a few yards in Manhattan. The last known scheduled freight train float ferry service in New York City ceased operations in 1978. This service was operated by the New York Dock Railway, which provided freight train transportation between Brooklyn and Manhattan. The New York Dock Railway operated a unique system where loaded freight rail cars were floated across the East River on specially designed barges, allowing for the continuation of rail service between the two boroughs. The loaded rail cars would be positioned on barges, and then the barges would be towed by tugboats across the river. Once the barge arrived at its destination, the rail cars would be unloaded, and the freight would be transported to its final destination via rail. However, with the decline of industrial manufacturing activities in the city, the demand for this type of transportation diminished. The New York Dock Railway faced financial difficulties and the freight train float ferry service was no longer economically viable. Most float terminals were just abandoned, marked today only by the eerie sight of pilings decaying on the riverbanks. So let's have a look at what's left. Gantry Plaza State Park is a 12-acre state park on the East River in the Hunters Point section of Long Island City. The park is located in a former dockyard and manufacturing district and includes remnants of facilities from the area's past. The park's most prominent feature is a collection of bridge-like structures which once made up the float transfer terminal. These massive industrial structures are contrasted with the beauty of a modern park. Built in 1925, they once loaded and unloaded railcar floats that served industries on Long Island via the Long Island Railroad's North Shore Freight Branch. 
In the past, this line ran on the south side of 48th Avenue, now part of Hunters Point Park. Turning to the northern portion of the park, we find a part of the former Pepsi bottling plant that closed back in 1999. This freight branch was located below street level and infilled in the early 2000s. The park contained a 120 foot long, 60 foot high, ruby colored neon metal Pepsi Cola sign. Manufactured by the General Outdoor Advertising Company all the way back in 1939, it was rebuilt in 1993 and stands today as a testament of that sign. The sign was located on the top of the bottling plant before it was dismantled to be housed in its new permanent location in 2009. The park first opened in 1998 and was expanded in July of 2009 with the Pepsi Cola sign now being designated a New York City landmark since April the 12th, 2016. Hence, it's safe to assume that these float terminals might stand for generations to come. However, I'm skeptical that the same could be said about the 69th Street Transfer Bridge. The 69th Street Transfer Bridge, part of the west side line of the New York Central Railroad, was a dock for car floats that allowed the transfer of railroad cars from rail lines to car floats that crossed the Hudson River to Weehawken Yards, New Jersey. Its innovative link span design kept the box cars from falling into the river while being loaded. Although nothing stopped those same link spans from falling into the river themselves years after abandonment. After it fell into disuse, it was in danger of being torn down and removed altogether. That was until around the year 2000, during renovations of Riverside Park. Following the example of Gantry Plaza State Park, it became a prominent feature of the park itself. It was listed on the National Register of Historic Places in 2003. This park can offer visitors an appreciation for the physicality of time, with the float links slowly withering away in the murky waters. What I find interesting is that some of the region's islands also had float transfer terminals. Such was the case at Governor's Island, a major military installation complete with a rail network to support its operations. The rail float at Governor's Island was a barge-like structure specifically designed to transport rail cars across the water. Loaded cars would be rolled onto the float, which was then towed by tugboats between the island and Manhattan or Brooklyn. The rail float facilitated the movement of supplies, equipment, and personnel to and from Governor's Island, allowing for efficient transportation without needing fixed bridges or tunnels. This feature was essential for maintaining the island's connection to the mainland rail network. However, rail float operations at Governor's Island ceased to exist in the late 20th century. As the military use of the island diminished, the need for rail floats diminished as well. These days, Governor's Island is primarily a recreational and cultural destination, and there are no active rail float operations on the island, nor has any trace of them been left behind. We also have Pier 66, which during the late 19th and early 20th centuries served as a transfer point for freight trains utilizing train floats. The pier was equipped with a transfer bridge, a structure that allowed loaded cars to be moved from tracks onto floating barges, establishing rail freight transportation across the Hudson River. In modern times, Pier 66 has been transformed into a recreational space known as Chelsea Piers, which features sports facilities, parks, and other amenities. However, you can still see the outline of tracks that once ran onto a link span and now serves no purpose. Across the river in Jersey City, we have Greenville Yard, which also had train floats. The Greenville Yard was a major rail yard and freight terminal operated by various railroad companies, including the Pennsylvania Railroad and later Conrail. The yard utilized a train float to transfer loaded freight rail cars across the Hudson River as a part of its operation. One unique aspect of this float is that after facing a period of near abandonment, it has been renovated and put back into operation. Comparing satellite imagery from 2010, we can see disconnected rails, sunken elements, broken link spans, and a barge overgrown with grass. Fast forward to the modern day and it appears to be in use. 
This isn't the only example of train floats still in use for freight in New York City. In fact, for freight train cars wishing to travel between Brooklyn and Manhattan, passage by water might still be the best route. Freight trains can also travel from Brooklyn to Manhattan using the freight rail infrastructure available in this region. And this is for good reason. You see, without floats, freight trains can only travel from Brooklyn to Manhattan the long way around, or by using the rail network's existing connections where goods can be further transferred to Manhattan by trucking or other modes of transportation. For example, freight trains from Brooklyn might travel to rail yards such as Oak Point in the Bronx or Fresh Pond in Queens, where goods can be transferred to trucks to their final delivery in Manhattan. With that in mind, if you need to move a physical train from Brooklyn to Manhattan, the 65th Street Yard might be your best option. Located on the Upper New York Bay in Sunset Park and Bay Ridge, Brooklyn, this yard is equipped with two transfer bridges that allow rail cars to be loaded and unloaded onto car floats. This facility represents the last of a once extensive car float operation in the port of New York and New Jersey. It was located adjacent to the Brooklyn Army Terminal and linked significantly to the city's rail freight network in the first half of the 20th century. It was later used as a conventional rail yard at the end of the Bay Ridge Branch, with the new float transfer bridges constructed in 1999 and put into use in 2012. This yard made the news and reminded New Yorkers of their historic rail link to the sea, when on July the 15th, 2022, the MTA transferred their retired 1960s era R32 subway cars onto barges and floated them across the Hudson on their way to Ohio, where they would be disposed of as scrap metal. Now, if you're into train history, I just visited Europe's longest narrow gauge train tunnel, a video you can check out in the members area by clicking right here. Otherwise, don't miss our playlist about the history of trains, and please consider subscribing. Until next time, this is Ryan Sokash, signing off.